All right, man. Welcome to the introduction for Crow Triple Seven Radio, episode 156. I have Jason Lingren with me today, and we asked the great Baldini to come back. We had so many requests uh, to bring him back and to further the conversation we had last time. And truth be told, Jason and I both felt like we didn't have enough time within the two hours to cover the scope of things we had on board. In short, we brought the great Baldini back, and again, we have a heck of a conversation. He's a very intelligent man, but it's an interesting show, and as is always true, in hour two, we say all kinds of things and talk about things we just can't in hour one. I'll have everyone know the last episode up that was with uh, Chris Van Maitre about filming The Double Sun, or trying to, was censored out of the gate everywhere. I got messages all over Europe, Germany, California even. Uh, by the end of the day, some of those places were writing me back saying they could view the video, but out of the gate, it was censored. So, I mean, is filming the sun now a social media crime? I don't know. Let's jump in with Jason Lingrid and the great Baldini. Cheers. All right, man. Welcome to Crow 777 Radio. This is episode 156. I have Jason Linger with me, and we have asked the great Baldini to return. Um, a lot of requests to have him back. It kind of felt like we pinched off the other conversation that we had, which I agree. There were a lot of things we could have covered uh, that time didn't permit, or we had to deal with the first hour nonsense of censorship. Uh, welcome, Jason. Yes, it's the return of the great Baldini, and no, it's not a 20th century Hammer horror film. <laughs> so let's get our couple things into the intro here and maximize our time. Oh, I know what I wanted to mention. Uh, I put up the talk we had with Chris Van Maitre, who also used a solar max scope to film the anomaly that I filmed. Uh, that whole conversation about us trying to work out if there is any there there, if we're overlooking something, uh, if we can get more people to go out and film, that was immediately censored on upload. The moment I uploaded it, I realized I wasn't getting hits. And the new nonsensical YouTube interface, which prevents you from understanding easily how many subs you've lost and all the things they've done with that, the new video didn't list. I knew I was being censored. And lo and behold, the email started to pour in. I'm in Germany. I can't see the film. I'm in Sweden. I can't see the clip. In California, of all places, uh, all across Canada, many parts of Europe, and as I launched the modern-day book-burning campaign to cast a light on this nonsense that goes on, uh, slowly I started getting more emails as the day went on. I can see the clip now, and then by the following day, uh, it listed in the nonsensical creator studio that Google has forced us all to use. But anyhow, we should probably mention the film, Jason, and get on with it. Well, first of all, in regards to censorship, there's the very lovely black hole picture that was released right after all the Double Sun stuff, and that probably ate up a lot of the hits that would come to a Google search, wouldn't you say? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, we know certainly that the Big Bang is proven nonsensical um, by the laws of thermodynamics, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be because I didn't know we were going to talk about this. But if I'm not mistaken, the laws of thermodynamics also make black holes a nonsensical tale. And since we know the actor named Stephen Hawking was the prime mover and shaker, I think we all have a pretty good idea of what we're looking at there. Now, as far as the film is concerned, it's selling really well. I've been getting nothing but outstanding feedback. And thank you to everyone who has uh, taken the time to get back to us about that. I really appreciate it. But also, very importantly, we are having the theater premiere in New Orleans on April 21st at the Zeitgeist Theater at 6.45 p.m., and then we'll do a Q&A and meet and greet afterward. Totally free event. Come on out. All right. The time listed is clearly New Orleans time. You can RSVP to shoot the moon movie at gmail.com if you'd like to attend there. And I concur. I have seen a couple negative comments, but it was clearly haters, so that doesn't mean much to me. For the most part, it's been just overwhelmingly positive, and as a matter of fact, a ton of people have become interested in filming the sky, haven't they? Yes, they have, so that's why we're doing things the way we've been doing them lately. All right, let's max this out. You want to you wanna get the great Baldini in here and so we can pick up where we left off? Well, it did feel like a three quarters of a conversation last time. So yes, the great Baldini has returned to us and we want to welcome you back to the show. And let's just kind of pick up where we left off with the security state that is worldwide through technological insanity. And we'll just take it from there. Baldini, welcome back. 
Hey, it's a pleasure to be back with you guys. And, um, <laughs> surprisingly, so soon, I, uh, it was such short notice, I, I figured that you couldn't find a real guest, so you asked me. So I'm, I'm always <laughs> always happy to be here. Uh, a number of um, really nice uh, comments from listeners, and uh, uh, I was touched and humbled. So uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you guys. Actually, the opposite of that is so many people asked us to have you back because what Jason said, they felt that we didn't quite have time to cover as much as we could have. But go ahead, Jason. Picking up where we left off. Let's talk about the security state and where we're at today and all the things that you've seen and experienced and learned and all of that. And we have the Internet that is a worldwide interconnected thing now. It's all of us communicating with each other. And that is directly tied in with all of this security protocol stuff that you were discussing and big data and all of that. So this directly ties in with artificial intelligence, no doubt in my mind, and I don't think in any of ours, right? No, absolutely. So let's start it there. What do you think about the state of artificial intelligence? For instance, what about a hypothetical that the entire internet is actually a giant mechanical brain and shuffling data around of pornography and kitty videos is actually just a uh, secondary thought. And it's actually something that they've been working on for decades and all the different nodes and things like that all over the world are actually the different electronic neurons interacting with each other. Well, I think that, you know, what you've said there, uh, Jason, quite quite a mouthful. I think there's certainly some evidence of it. I mean, uh, again, I'm all, often loath to make um, claims of fact when, I, when it's some things that are difficult to prove. But certainly from abductive reasoning, kind of a combination of inductive and uh, deductive reasoning, when I kind of get to the to the best case or the most likely scenario, it does appear uh, that uh, a lot of the technology um, was foisted on us with um, the premise that it would be uh, to our benefit. It would make things easier and we'd have a better, quicker way of communicating. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the people that are in charge, who, whoever they are, um, and maybe we'll discuss later who, who they are. We, we say they a lot as we discuss these things, but it might be uh, relevant to, to sort of take a look at that. But it does seem that they operate at a glacial pace. Uh, with immense forethought and, and typically malice, so it does. Uh, it does appear that this was uh, set into set into place uh, for the specific purpose uh, of uh, getting us to reveal our thoughts and our uh, our behaviors, our patterns of behaviors, our characteristics, uh, revealing them unaware to begin with, and then with the uh, rise of social media, or as I call it, anti-social media. Um, because it really does tend to break us down more than bring us together. Uh, but we uh, overshare, uh, at least most people do, to such an enormous degree that it's remarkable. And that's the things that we offer uh, intentionally, not to mention, again, all the, the ways that they capture our data without our knowledge. Let's pull this into a real world scenario where we kind of assume, and as you say, uh, showing the proof in the pudding is not always easy, but with reasoning, we can be relatively sure. As an example of that, there is so much data every day, we can consider that data set to be infinite. There's only one way an infinite data set could be dealt with, and that's with automation, right? Or AI, basically. Um, so I think using deductive reasoning, we can kind of kind of point in that direction. But we know a place in the world where a lot of the technology created here in the West is being implemented fast track, don't we? And I'm referring to China here, which we mentioned a little before we began to record. Um, let's talk a little bit about how that was implemented. And I think it's pretty clear that when you start to use facial recognition on every camera in a city and these types of thing, AI has to be part of the engine driving that. Would you agree? Agree. And that's the, you know, the only way you can drive uh, really the facial recognition is deep machine learning is kind of what they call it. And um, the artificial intelligence that uh, that drives that and derives the data and makes meaning of it. So, uh, again, as we were discussing a little bit uh, before the show started, China has rolled out in the last two years or so uh, what they call a social credit score which monitors all your behaviors, uh, including interactions and how you pay your bills and what you post online and, and your attitudes and who you support. And if you say something bad about, uh, about the chairman or the government, um, those are all aggregated to give you a combined social credit score. And that is meaningful in your day-to-day -day transactions. You might not be able to get an apartment. 
or you might not be able to buy a car uh, or even get into a club or any of these things based on your social credit score. And this is a result, again, of the aggregate data of, um, uh, of everything that you do, as well as the artificial intelligence that runs, as you mentioned, the, um, uh, the cameras. They have um, more than 160 million cameras uh, in their, just their major cities uh, that are all on 24-7 and monitor everyone's movements and interactions, uh, where they go, what they do, what they buy. And it all uh, combines with the other data that they're giving up just via their cell phone. Can't we logically kind of work out that in the direction that this is headed? And I would point out uh, when you have the type of government that is existing in China right now, it's very quick to implement things. Someone at the top snaps their finger. They did it with the green movement. Someone at the top said, guess what? We're going organic or we're recycling. And it happens overnight pretty much compared to how things happen here. But when we get back to case in point here, this must head in a direction where cash needs to go away and people without smart devices can't exist either, right? I mean, those those two things are foregone conclusions if we head on this track. That seems inevitable uh, to me. I, I think that, um, you know, what, what we see is, again, you mentioned the, uh, the cultural differences, you know, in Asian cultures, um, be, being part of the one, the greater one is is valued, whereas in the West, uh, we have more of an independent maverick spirit. Uh, so people have to be more convinced here, I guess, is the is the key. But um, yeah, cer- certainly, I think that um, they, they always pitch it as a good thing. For example, if you want to look at cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, um, the premise initially was that, oh, we're getting away from central banking and, and this is going to be good for the independent person. But ultimately, it's total control. You, you have a uh, you know, everything that you do, again, uh, purchases are not only monitored, but completely controlled. So if you um, get a black mark on your social credit score, uh, you won't have access to your money. Uh, so, you know, I think the the, the pitch for uh, having a cashless society and, for example, an RFID implant makes a lot of sense on the surface. You could certainly pitch it as uh, there can be no more blackmail would be would go away. You couldn't have counterfeiting. Nobody could steal your wallet. Nobody could hold you up for cash. Uh, there's a lot of uh, positives uh, that could be seen. But again, the problem is who's controlling it. And that's that's where the poison is. Now, Baldini, what do you know about the whole cryptocurrency, digital currency thing? Because not to seem rude here, but it does seem like there's a whole lot of useful idiots pushing for this sort of thing. And I just really have my doubts that it's a legitimate thing when you really look at it under a fine microscope. Well, you, you make a great point, Jason. And, and I I will, I guess, back up a bit to something that I, um, you know, mentioned uh, last time uh, that we talked, which is, well, again, if you give the, the sort of the premise that everyone says that they want the truth, if you ask anybody, they'll say, yes, I, I want the truth. But most people really just want affirmation that what they believe is true, right? And they they recoil from, from actual truth. So when we look at, at these things, I think one of the problems that we have is we try to look for uh, you know, again, as truth or community, right? We try to look for the things that are true. And that's, again, so obfuscated at this point that I think one of the best things you can do is back up and look at it the other way. Um, ex- just start from the position that everything is probably a lie and then work out from there. So so if you uh, approach cryptocurrency with the same uh, idea that, uh, okay, it's being um, pushed on us and celebrated in the media that we know is controlled by somebody else, the same club, right? They're not likely to give us any actual information that's going to be helpful to us. So uh, if they're pushing the idea that it's a great thing and, oh, it, it's somehow circumventing the, the Fed and this is your way around it, you should be suspicious of that. Well, I'm, what I'm getting at here is, and again, I don't mean to be rude about it, it's this whole anarchy movement that's all over the world now. I don't think that those folks really quite understand what they're on about. It's a great idea. I'm not saying it's not. But again, I think they're being useful idiots for some folks higher up the totem pole. What do you think? Well, and that's what that's I guess what I, I was also again just trying to say is that they um, they they believe because they want to believe. And the same point that I made in our in our last conversation uh, about the use of the magician's trick, right, is that uh, misdirection and, and the the illusion in part works because people want to believe it. So if you give people something that will answer their questions. If you give them a say, you know, if they need a savior, you're going to give them a savior. If they think that's through cryptocurrency and circumventing the Fed, or if, if you give them Julian Assange and he's going to tell the truth. I can't say, you know, may, maybe he actually thought he was doing some good like Snowden. Uh, but ultimately, those things don't happen 
unless the controllers allow it to happen. Yeah, that's that's the critical thing to remember here. But with cryptocurrency, it gets a bit easier to deduce what's actually going on. How many people think that they can log on to social media right now and use it as they will? Is there anyone listening who hasn't been affected by censorship in one way, shape, or form? Well, how is that done? Well, first of all, the people censoring you own the platform. Secondarily, what you need to get to the platform is called the internet, which is also controlled and owned and operated by corporations. The whole totality of Bitcoin does not work without the very backbone that allows the censorship to happen in Facebook or or YouTube or any other place. And I have said for a long time, and it's probably coming, the moment that we go to some kind of a digital currency and dollars and cents are out the window, in my view, will be the day that we lose more freedom as human beings than we ever have in our lifetime. And I've used the example that you go to the ATM or whatever the money machine is called that allows you to get currency or move currency and says, sorry, you can't have money today because your driver's license needs to be renewed. That is the kind of control where it starts. And we already see varying versions of this um, in other ways. Um, What do you think about that, Baldini? Absolutely, uh, Crow. And I think, you know, just if you focus in on the just the history of Bitcoin itself, I mean, uh, again, you got a declared pseudonym, Nakamoto, uh, creates this thing. Uh, so you got this enigmatic, enigmatic figure nobody knows anything about, and it's celebrated in the media. That really should tell you something right away. Right. Uh, and, and then as, as you pointed out, Crow, all the um, as we tie it all together back to the idea of uh, artificial intelligence, um, aggregating and uh, combing through all the data and making sense out of it, right? That's where the social credit score comes in. And, uh, oh, you can't, you know, you, you can't get your driver's license renewed. You can't get your money because your driver's license is expired, but you can't get your driver's license renewed because you don't have access to your money. And then they have you at a catch 22. There's another angle on this too. Do we do anything online right now that's not monitored? So what that tells you is if cryptocurrency of some kind takes hold, every transaction is monitored. Every transaction. Go go ahead and try to buy a joint of weed somewhere where it's not legal when you're on cryptocurrency. That's going to get logged. And these are just obvious on the face of it examples. But I think what you said about the supposed and I say supposed with quotes around it, inventor of cryptocurrency really shows everybody what they need to know. Nobody knows who the hell created it. Nobody knows who the hell controls it. And all they do know is the media, and as Jace will say, useful idiots pointing out what a great thing this is and how we can get around the Rothschild banking system and the Fed and the IRS and all this other nonsense. Um, I would say that cryptocurrency allows infinitely more control than any of those things we're complaining about right now. Jason? Well, I like the concept of the digital currency, but good grief, the implications are obscene, really. It's another huge part of what the overall power structure can use to completely clamp down on us. Everything's going to be digital. Your entire life is going to be digital. They've got you addicted to the internet, addicted to your phones, every aspect of your life being at the swipe of a button. Now, Baldini, what do you know about the whole anarchy movement and the blockchain technology and all that? Because these conferences that they have are doing an amazing job of drawing more people into the fold so that no shadowy organization behind the scenes really needs to do anything. They're doing it for them. And you have very enigmatic figures out there screaming and yelling about how this is the way to do things. And while I think it's a lovely concept, I think that it's seven steps away from where we're at in today's society. And we're just not ready for it, even if there was nothing nefarious behind it. But I believe there is. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, at the risk of repeating myself, right, that, that the reason that the mouse gets caught in the trap is because he doesn't know why the cheese is free. So I- anytime that you think that there's, again, it's going to be something that seems too good to be true, it probably is. So we can tie a few of these things together, right? So uh, Bitcoin, the idea that, oh, we can uh, circumvent the big banksters and we're going to have something of our own. Oh, um, here's, uh, here's Assange with WikiLeaks. If you're going to whistleblow, here's the place to go. Right. So it's um, always controlled opposition. Here's uh, Alex Jones with Prison Planet. Right? And again, I don't mean to offend anybody who follow these guys and think the world of them. But again, I would just say reconsider 
who you follow, right? There's not that there probably won't give you some truth somewhere, uh, but if it seems too good to be true, uh, re- remember in 1984, uh, O'Brien was was to Winston the hero, right? He was the leader of the movement. Uh, so uh, anytime that we're presented with a, a, an option to, to sneak out or uh, he, here's, uh, you know, so, something that's that's against the man, right? So in the same way that, um, you know, music has, has been controlled for the longest time. Uh, so it's the record companies telling you uh, to buy the music that's supposedly against the man, really. Um, if you just apply some logical thinking to this and understand um, who is in control of things, it, it becomes much easier to discern uh, what the message is. If they're trying to sell you something as being good for you, I can pretty much guarantee you it's not. You know, it's a funny thing. It's almost like official places like TV studios. To the average person, they have this patina of reality on them that they don't deserve in any way, shape, or form. After you and I talked last time about the fraud, Julian Assange, and WikiLeaks, um, and I pointed out that it was just all a put-up to get people to rat their own self out if they had something to blow the whistle on, um, I had endless comments. And you could tell from the tone and tenor of comments, it was people, like you said earlier, they just want to believe. They haven't done any research. They just saw this thing come across the news and they said, yep, I'm believing that. Uh, When the flip side of that is, is exactly what you're saying. If you don't accept anything on the face of it from authority, but you challenge it, you pretty quickly arrive at a more accurate assessment of what's going on here. And as we exist now, um, not quite wholly online, but we're getting there quickly, but certainly television or so-called news. These are all controlled mediums and whatever comes out of that television set is meant for your ears. And that it's that simple, basically. Agreed. And, and programming is, is thusly, you know, it's, it's rightly named programming. And there, uh, I think every one of your listeners should really just take this to heart that anything that is revealed in the media, um, even if it, even if it purports to expose some hidden truth, um, you're meant to hear it. Yeah, it was funny. You know, it's the whole nonsense Pizzagate thing. Uh, people were arguing about that. And when I tried to tell them it's just more nonsense, they said, well, why would they out those people? And I just asked a simple question. What people? The people that didn't go to jail? Who got outed? You know, <laughs> what what was the result of this? And it always, almost always echoes back to the Montague Norman speech from the Central Bank in England. He comes over and his main goal is to use political parties to argue endlessly about things that don't matter. That is case and point and the reason for the existence of media and news and things in this country. Um, But it's a little bit worse than that because they tell you a lot of things that aren't true. And there's no law currently on the books that I'm aware of that says they got to tell you anything true. Everything they put out in the course of a newscast could be made up out of whole cloth. And as far as I know, they're not violating any rule. Well, as far as I know, there are laws stating that we can be propagandized against in the United States. Indeed. Sure. So let me let me then uh, turn this around and and, um, ask you the questions of both Crow and Jason. What's what's your threshold? What 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 uh, what's your threshold to accept uh, something as uh, potentially true or being a there there? Well, it starts with research, doesn't it? And just the very act of not believing in things is a big step in the right direction. Because if you do that over a course of years, you get an aroma immediately out of the gate. You're in the kitchen. You can smell, hey, man, something's burning in, in in the kitchen. I can smell it. I'm not sure what's burning, but I know damn well something's burning. You get this adult higher mind. And from there, you can start to challenge it. And the human mind, anyone's adult human mind, has the ability to challenge things out to a reasonable conclusion. But the main point here is, is if you feel like you can't get a reasonable conclusion, set it the hell aside. Don't just adopt it or believe in it. Um, Belief is, in fact, the enemy of knowing. And I say it over and over and over. Do you want to believe things or do you want to know things? Which two of, you know, which of those options are you more interested in? If you're interested in knowing things, then you have to become a person that accepts nothing that doesn't get challenged. I mean, where are you at, Jason? I always look back to the realities that we have already uncovered. Mainstream media has the big six, as they're called. So almost all information that is put out to the public comes through one of these organizations. Second of all, we have the information that Tom gave us on how news comes through one of these 
high-end news organizations, prepackaged and ready to go. That tells me everything I need to know. If it's being given to you on a mainstream platform, it's coming from a higher-up source, and it's already been sautéed, prepared, and garnished for your dining pleasure. So let, let's flip this back, and I'll point this one over to you, Baldini. Um, everybody in, in the United States of America who still consumes movies and medias is waiting with bated breath for the new Game of Thrones to come out in the next week or so. There's another delivery tool, isn't it? They know that the viewership on a program like this is going to be off the charts huge. Um, so what can we expect uh, to be thrown in with all that entertainment? Well, I think you're going to expect to find some hidden truths there, as they as they always put in. I find, uh, for myself, I find that the uh, the majority of really uh, interesting things that that are tells uh, about where we're at and the history of how we got here has have almost all been derived uh, from little Easter eggs uh, in some sort of uh, popular culture, media, sci-fi, movie. That's where that's where they hide it in an effort to, uh, you know, distance from it and to make it um, seem <clears throat> preposterous. Uh, so I think that um, if, you know, I, I haven't sat through an entire episode of, uh, I'm one of the, you know, five people, I guess, who haven't watched that that show uh, religiously, six. but okay, six now. Perfect. <laughs> Good for you, Jason. Uh, but, but I would say that um, I would be enormously surprised if you didn't find <laughs> Uh, both some interesting information there and uh, that it was timed both with the sky clock and uh, to obfuscate something else happening in the real world uh, that they want to distract you from. It's all a game of well, distraction and misdirection. Well, well said. It's going to be timed to the sky clock. Even the release of it is, um, but it's going to be wholesale programming. But let's Let's do another. Let's let's do an example of a logical deduction um, from things people are familiar with. So, since we're talking about film, kind of here, let's talk about film for a minute. And you, let's use the movie Ready Player One, which, incidentally, I've been on the record as saying it's the only movie I've paid for in in memorable history um, because I read the book and I understood that it was an accurate projection of where things are wanted to head. So, if we look at a film like Ready Player One, there is so much we can deduce about where we currently are. And you could do something as simple as look back to the 60s. You might get a movie, like there were a whole bunch, let, let's go back to the 80s. There, there were all these teen movies uh, by John Hughes, and they were hugely popular with my generation. Everyone loved John Hughes. They felt like he was representing what we all experienced, whether he was or not. He did things like, I think, The Breakfast Club, uh, Ferris Bueller, these types of movies. But back in the day, for them to have a great soundtrack to help drive that movie, they either hired a band to do the whole soundtrack or they paid copyrights on music. And when they paid copyrights on music, typically what you would see is one very well-known popular song that somehow fit the theme. They would pay copyrights on it. Now let's jump up to Ready Player One. How many copyrights do you suppose would have had to be played? I think you see every Disney character. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's every character from Star Wars to, to anything, any cartoon you've ever seen, any movie you've ever seen, any television show, they're all in there. So how the hell did Spielberg make that movie and not owe copyrights to every organization in this world? And that echoes directly back to what Jason was talking about, the big six, which I actually mark as the big two corporations that own everything. Probably, and I'm just guessing here because there's no way I can certainly know, I know damn well he used copyrighted material from every every period of American culture just about. He probably picked up the phone and called corporate headquarters and said, you know, do we own <laughs> these dizzy assets do we own these looney tunes characters do we own you know it had to be something like this otherwise how could you possibly pay for all the copyrights i mean but what do you think about all that well i, I mean i'll just t take it back to its um, well what you're saying there and just affirm that anytime that you have supposed competitors um pushing for the same goal that should tell you something I mean, we've had the, you know, the Antarctic uh, Protection Treaty since, what, 1956 uh, with uh, numerous countries that were supposedly on the verge of global nuclear warfare. Uh, and it's been uh, the only treaty that's been successfully maintained since then. What does that tell you uh, <laughs> about the players? Right. That, that they're uh, right. The, the entire idea of them being in competition or, or having antipathy for each other is preposterous. So as I you know, have stated before, when you begin to. Uh, 
to grab a hold of any of the threads of what's presented as reality and start to tug on them and tease them. Eventually, the whole thing comes undone. Yeah, about that treaty. <laughs> How much do you know about that? <laughs> I knew I was sitting here being quiet because I, I knew he couldn't let it go. <laughs> hey, hey Baldini, what the hell do you know about that treaty? <laughs> well, I, I'm very well aware of it. It's funny that he brought it up. What do you know, man? Well, uh, well, I I know what you know. I think a lot of researchers know, and probably not much more. I mean, I, I follow the. I follow the breadcrumbs as well. I look at it and I say, well, that isn't that odd. The timing was particular odd. If you if you go back and, and you look at uh, Admiral Byrd's visits and the things that he said, um, I, one of the most viewed, um, you know, the uh, Longines chronoscope and his conversation uh, about the uh, the undiscovered land there and you put and the things that he said, and then you put the timing together uh, with the geophysical year and their celebration of that. And then they're going to protect what penguins down there. Um, <laughs> anything, anything below um, 60 degrees South latitude. I mean, come on. Uh, so, so and then you've got, you know, operation high jump and deep freeze. And, and then the timing with that, with the operation fishbowl um, and they're shooting all these supposed nuclear weapons straight up. Um, there, there's a lot to, to dig apart. There, I think you know that certainly that's a, an episode in itself. But um, th- there's, I don't think again anybody who who looks at this with a, a desire to learn, right, and um, just won't say that this thing stinks to high heaven. Um, y- you know, I mean, again, at the at the risk of you know offending some people, I just you know, quote a little a little scripture in um, in Proverbs, right? Uh, the mocker seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge comes easily to the discerning. If you want to make fun of something, I mean, note all the uh, all the debunking channels of, of everything. If you want, you know, uh, if you want to look for anything on YouTube now, um, you get it. What you're going to get is pages after page of debunking uh, to begin with. Um, they don't have anything to offer other than making fun of people. So, so again, these things should tell you something. If you want to know who you're, uh, who's in charge, find out who you're not allowed to criticize. If you want to know what the truth is, find out wh- what they're making fun of. One of the things we should keep in mind um, is that we constantly, as a society, act like the animals in Animal Farm because we miss the changing of the rules on the barn wall, don't we? Um, you know, if we go back to Operation Poppycock or whatever bird, bird, <laughs> bird, bird's the word was up to, uh, you know, he's telling us at the time that there's more land beyond the South Pole than I forget what he said. United States and Canada put together something like this, a right. lot of land. And there's all these natural resources. How is it? that we're in the modern age and we don't have 24 seven shots over the North pole and Antarctica. Well, one of the things that folks really have to take into mind here with all of this information, it's not just that places like YouTube are trying to skew things for you and and offer you helpful Wikipedia and encyclopedia Britannic articles. There's also a large group of useful idiots helping the system by accusing everybody who actually tries to do any work and challenge the mainstream. They're being called shills. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I got my paycheck this year yet. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets old. You got you to go at this, Baldini, but that that is total programming, right? Every time I see someone write it, I just think, geez. Well, you're a shill. I've never been accused directly of being a shill, but you're a shill. And uh, I think everybody in the Flat Earth Movement is a shill. And I'm pretty sure most of the people who uh, challenge things like, oh, any false flag event, I think those are, they're all shill. So if everyone's a shill... Well, who's actually the real truth seekers? I, I guess there aren't any. Or maybe it's these armchair truthers who don't actually contribute anything to the narrative other than slinging poo like a monkey through the bars at the zoo. <laughs> Shouldn't I be getting paid shillings or something? <laughs> because I haven't got that paycheck yet. A- anyhow, go, go ahead. Well, well no, I, in fact, I, I noticed after um, one episode uh, with you, Crow, and that's the really the, the first and only interview that I've, I've had for, for decades. Um, I, I know that people are skeptical of things I say. I may, made a misstatement about um, speaker wiring and somebody got all up in arms about it. It's like, hey, I, you know, I was nervous. I misstated it. It's happened before. But uh, on the other hand, I, I don't blame them. I'm skeptical, skeptical of everybody as well. But, you know, you back up and look at the context and go, what would anybody have to gain but by simply uh, repeating things that you can easily go find for yourself? All right. So um, I, I, I whether we want to do this now or whether we'd like to do it in the sit in the second hour i do have sort of a litmus test for you know disingenuous those, those putting out information that people should i just sort of have these criteria that i look at i don't know again if you want to let's, touch on it now or 
Yeah, let's do it right now, man. This is the this is the biggest audience. You know, I've told Jason, uh, YouTube has a shelf life. They've already jumped the shark. They've already shown us what they're about. They're about censorship. And I am not going to stand for censorship. So when it becomes to the point where they want to exert more than I'm willing to accept, I'll just bail and I'll keep doing what I'm doing. But let's do it. What's your litmus test? Well, so uh, again, I got the, a few criteria here. And um, I think I- anybody might meet one of these. It's people who meet uh, more than that. And again, I, I, I share kind of shy away generally from naming names. I'm not going to make any accusations, but you could plug in any of your favorite um, content providers and see uh, if they meet these. I think one of the first things I look for is, um, uh, you know, what we say in marketing is first to market, first to mind. And I would say that that, uh, that applies here early to market, uh, early to mind. They usually are going to present um, new information or ideas ahead of the curve. Uh, so they're going to be one of the first people to bring this out. I consider those typically controlled leaks. Um, and again, this serves as sort of a litmus test as uh, to who the pro- who's going to accept the programming and who's not. Will it? Uh, will people just shut it down or, or will they look into it? So that that's one of the first ones. And you guys feel free to jump in at any point. Well, I've got a big one. Are they making millions of dollars at doing it? And that's another thing on my list, yes, which is, um, <laughs> I think it's about uh, six down here, which is um, they... Uh, immediately get a rapid growth with a large following, right? That um, now it can happen organically, I suppose, if you've got really good content. But um, but anybody who operates a, a YouTube channel or a social media channel um, knows that uh, the numbers get fudged. Um, if you're doing the right things, you're going to get shadow banned. Your results are downranked, that sort of thing. So uh, if somebody has a channel that's specifically debunking people or uh, even pretends to be a truther but has outrageous, phenomenal instant growth uh, with subscriber numbers and views that are just off the charts and not consistent with what you would normally see, I think that's they're worth a, a second look. Well, there's there's an interesting bit of data I could pop in here. At this point, um, Google refers to the website. They used to be the lead referrer to Crow777radio.com. It is now down, get this, 88%. Go ahead, count it, 88% yeah. from what it used to be historically over many years. But go ahead, Jason. Great Scott. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Uh, uh, so the first one I would say would be they come out of nowhere. Yes, they. Uh, and- <laughs> somebody you haven't heard of before, um, no background. Also, I think here's a, a key one is that um, the, informa- the information they're, they're offering often will seem above their level. Um, and again, I don't mean that to be rude, but the research is like more solid than their presentation. Um, a certain particularly, uh, I would just say, uh, kind of dubious guy comes to mind um, with with like 200 proofs. Um, <laughs> it feels really incongruous with their vibe, right? Their, their level of presentation uh, doesn't match the research. So somebody gave that to them, especially when they're, they're an early provider of it. Uh, or somebody who gives you um, supposedly inside info, but it's really impossible to that. Um, so like Q, again, I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm sure that people have their favorites, but these are things I look for, um, th- uh, for disingenuous information that's going to lead you astray. That's one guy, if I think, if anybody really is a shill, it's him, because he mixes too much weirdo, gender-bending crap in with his supposed devotion to the flat earth whole thing. It's just too bizarre, man. If you're that serious about trying to convince people that no, really the earth is flat and we're being lied to. Why would you mix it with a whole bunch of really weird out there stuff that most people aren't into? It seems so disingenuous. There's another tell that I always see too. And that's like the shill list. And this is unfortunate because I've seen channels that seem to be some of the most in tune channels uh, get caught up in this, but then I see other people And I guess I, you know, I don't name names because I don't care. I'm more interested in the research. But when you start doing that, you're showing, what are you interested in? Are you interested in what is the shape of our world? Are you interested in, did dinosaurs ever exist? Are you interested in, do nuclear weapons exist as described or satellites or anything else? Or are you interested in defaming people? And that is a huge tell for me. Yes, and that's the next one on, on my list. You, you kind of took the you know took the thunder, uh, which is again they start accusing other people being shills, agents, um, encouraging division, creating clicks in the community, 
Um, yeah. This is a big tell. They, they'll state that they're the one who started the topic or if it wasn't for them, uh, that it wouldn't have happened. And anybody else covering it is disinformation, even if similar in context and content. Um, they're going to say, um, I'm the leader. Uh, they become sort of a lightning rod for the topic. And they, especially if they don't support or embrace any alternative views, positions, or uh, other researchers, if they uh, tell it, say that everybody else is a shill, be critical of that. To say the least, of course, Crow Triple Seven's at the top of that list. And I have yet to figure out what exactly he's shilling about, other than the fact that people love to throw the same tired old things up about the lunar wave that we've disproved ages ago and they still say the same stupid things it's like come on guys get a new narrative already at least be imaginative with your bullshit well you know yeah i I mean i know where you're coming from i that for when you've when you've heard it all for this long you get to a point um and but the truth about that is is we don't know certainly what's causing that we have ideas we have theories um but we don't have a magic hot air balloon that will take us up so that we can go touch right. it or sample right. it. But you say as much. That's the whole point. You say that, and these people go on and on and on about how you're putting forth a narrative that you don't even subscribe to. This reminds me of the biblical scripture about casting your pearls before the swine. See, this is exactly yeah. what this is. If that person is so invested in whether a lunar wave exists or not, and I look at myself, I filmed it. I'm not nearly as invested as that person because I'm not going to sit there and argue or cast stones or these other things. It's one of these situations where, to me, that person just isn't ready. They want to choose a side or they want to believe in something. Um, If it's a serious person, you'll see them trying to disprove it or trying to go get more evidence, these types of things. That's, That's where I'm coming from. Yeah, you've got a really weak argument if all you have is ad hominem attacks, right? If you can't address the the information itself and have a credible, plausible uh, alternate hypothesis, then uh, and all you can do is um, you know na- you know make fun or or call names. Th- there's a problem, and and um, I say this all the time. Uh, you know you're over the target when the flack starts to increase. Well, it's not having an argument; it's just being contrary. Right. Yes. Again, that should tell you something. <laughs> That'd be a good episode. We could have a picture of a guy riding a horse backwards. <laughs> he could be a con- he could be a contrarian. Contrarian, my friend. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and again, uh, so I'll just kind of wrap up this list. Is one, uh, well, I guess, two more things here is that um, one is that they'll do or say something that makes them an easy target for debunking, or, or they act crazy, or they um, they will say something. Uh, very inflammatory. Again, that should tell you something. When somebody offers some truth and then acts like a freaking maniac, um, w- what are they trying to do? I don't know, but if you get drugged into court and then have to admit that you're actually an actor playing a character, that should kind of tell you everything. But what do I know? Oh, right. Well, wait um, a minute. I, wait a minute. What am I missing from mainstream? Did, did that happen, Jason? Is this my, yes. my, ig- my ignorance showing through because I don't watch <laughs> media? In the real world situation where Alex Jones got divorced, he had to go on the stand and part of his defense over the whole thing with his ex-wife was that he was playing a character. Oh, well, I guess there's a reason why I don't know those things. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I just thought it was really funny that he had to say such when he's under sworn oath, when millions of dollars of his personal wealth are at stake. Well, it, goes, I, I, it goes to show you all the world's a stage, right? Yeah. I mean, again, I don't, I don't really have a, you know, a dog in the hunt so much, but I, uh, I have. I wasn't frankly aware of the character of Bill Hicks uh, until um, you know later, and somebody pointed out that uh, he looked very similar. And then I did some background information, and um, it's th- th- there's no question in my mind, right, that it's the same guy. That uh, his uh, producer Kevin is the same person. He makes jokes about it, uh, so so it was easy to me to see that it's the same character. And so they faked his death with uh, with cancer, and he comes back as as Alec Jones. And he's playing this part. Uh, but people who are invested uh, and, and really like Bill Hicks, they get really terribly butthurt about that suggestion. It's like, well, um, <laughs> OK, I mean, you can believe what believe as you will. It's, it's nothing to me, but uh, you should be critical about it. Be careful who your heroes are. Right. Uh, be, because um, they're, they're probably not. That's a good point. But, I, you know, it, it reminds me of another tell that I've used for a long time. If science is a serious endeavor then is there any place in science for entertainment? And what we tend to see 
is that these scientific ideas will become the names of TV shows, the people pushing the idea, the actor formerly known as Stephen Hawking is a good example, where he's been on every freaking show known to men, some of them the most you know, viewed sitcoms in the country over the last decade or more, or Neil deGrasse Tyson, or any of these people we can mention, does a serious endeavor like scientific investigation have any truck with entertainment? And I would suggest it doesn't. As a matter of fact, early on, um, when I was producing clip after clip after clip with my telescope, um, I had the production company contact me that does ancient aliens and wanted to, you know, get me to be on their latest UFO show. And so I spoke with them. They sent me this contract and I laughed. I said, there is no serious researcher on the world that would ever sign this document because if they do they're not a serious researcher and the response to me was you'd be surprised who signs these documents and i said well i'm not going to be surprised because i ain't signing your damn document and see ya well that's because they uh they like the paycheck that's going to accompany that sure Uh, jason didn't we mention this um uh, i I suppose it was probably offline that the idea of you know space and entertainment has been conflated since the beginning i mean the very very first movie was a uh, trip to the moon right <laughs> right so i mean 1902 whatever it is so uh it's in their favor to conflate those things and you know disney and von braun were, were in bed together so um the, the, it's always uh, theater of the imagination right so all, all, all this stuff begins with imagine if dude I, I gotta i gotta ask you this question while we're on the topic so I don't know. A couple of weeks ago, I posted on Twitter um, a clip someone had sent me from, I think it's 1965. It's a black and white of a guy, what I view is telling the truth, saying the moon is plasma. Okay, so everyone's seen it. It's been making the rounds. I think that's correct where I am right now um, based on years of research. Not that I won't throw it out the damn window if I learn something new because I will. But right now, I think that is quite feasible. Can you imagine if the moon is in fact plasma and things I've said like words have meaning and why do we get a new moon every month? Why don't we get the same old moon? Why is it new? Um, How come you can't detect a new moon? How come you can't detect a moon in an eclipse? We've worked through some of these things, but Baldini, I got to ask you, the damn thing looks like it's made out of rock and dirt and that it's been pummeled by something, right? So if it actually was plasma, do you see where I'm going here? Mm-hmm. I mean, it almost looks like a mousetrap, don't it? <laughs> you, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> you have a habit of doing that, uh, Crow. Expand, um, expand. It's all you. No, I just, I, I think it, um, uh, uh, again, I just go back to pretty much every time that we hear, um, uh, let's say, a theoretical physicist start. They, the first thing they say is, imagine if, picture <laughs> in your mind. Right. I mean, that's going to tell you something. I mean, and the first time I saw the picture of Pluto and it had the, you know, the Disney dog in it, I was like, are are you kidding me? Uh, And and the people that just went crazy over it. I just I shake my head. I I don't even know. That was the largest attack to date when I took apart the Pluto nonsense. But it cracks me up that you you show how they cast the spell. They're not just giving you the middle finger. They're also blowing kisses at the same time. At the same time. It's like, uh, who did Principia? It's Newton, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so make sure I got a basic fact like that right, or I'll never hear the end of it. There are more freaking ifs in that book than anything you have ever read. If this is true, then that might be true. If, 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 it's the exact same thing. It's the spell cast that you just mentioned. Imagine this in your mind. And by the way, Star Trek premieres tonight, 1966. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. unreal. Yep. And I think, uh, so I just, uh, there was one other thing. And again, you hit on it, uh, presciently, uh, again, Crow is just, uh, uh, to try to wrap the idea of like, um, who to trust, who to not trust. I think one, one tell here is, and you mentioned a couple is they make frequent appearance in mainstream media, um, as the poster child for whatever topic or movement, um, you know, one or two hit pieces might not be that unusual. I know that, um, uh, you know, a couple of places took your lunar wave apart uh, because they're trying to mock it. That, that doesn't surprise me if somebody's again, close to the mark, they're going to, uh, somebody's going to try to shoot them down. But when somebody becomes sort of the poster child or makes uh, frequent appearances in the mainstream media, um, I consider that's probably, you know, they're part of the show. 
Well, er- early on, you know, I bumped into this. Uh, people coming out of nowhere within a couple months. They've been on every show known to man all the way up to coast to coast and dropping my name along the way like we're best friends. So I finally said, screw this, man. I'm going to do an interview to point out this is not my Siamese twin. So I do the interview, and then for a year, I'm sitting there with a scrub brush trying to rub the stink off me. (laughs) So I I learned a lesson, you know, I'm not going, I I just don't care anymore. I'll do what I do. If it has value, I hope to heck, you know, it gets utilized or furthered in some way. But Jason, we're coming close to the top of the hour here. Is there anything you want to get into the end of hour one? And tell Rose, I will not forget what I always forget. (laughs) Do you, do you have anything to add to the end of hour one before I begin to wrap up? Well, Baldini, did we go through your entire litmus test list? Because I think that's important to wrap up for hour one. Because unfortunately, not everyone comes over to hour two. Yeah, no, I think that we we covered the the most of the bits. And and I would just say to listeners, I mean, I, I'm uh, pretty much guaranteed that somebody's going to say, well, you lost me when you said that so-and-so. Um Look, I'm I'm making no assertions. Just saying, this is how I see it. Um, I think one or maybe even two of these things could uh, could be true about you know anybody. Uh, but when you start to put them all together, when you start to add up that score, um, that's uh, that's what you can take away from that. And again, it doesn't mean that they're not giving you some truthful information, or it wouldn't. You know, again, the the trap right. isn't valuable if there's no cheese in it. That's uh, right. But 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 I think that um, I, again, the the rational minded person, if you go into this with the idea that you're looking for truth and not to prove or disprove something, um, th- then you're you're better off. So, but yeah, that that's pretty much the list uh, there. And I, I, you know, my apologies if I've offended anybody by taking on your hero. I just say I, I don't really have any. I mean, well, I I didn't hear him miss the mark. Did you hear him miss the mark, Jason? No, because if you really do look at things objectively, no matter which of these characters you're into, eventually, as you're slogging out yourself another drink from the punch bowl, you're going to find the log floating in there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's there's one thing, too, that's obvious on the face of it. But as we pointed out, whether you choose to believe there's big five or big six or big two corporations left in the world headed for when Taco Bell owns it all, that's a joke, uh, till there's only one corporation left, um, what you can understand is all the airwaves that reach, and I'm just using airwaves broadly, all the communication methods that reach hundreds of thousands of minds are controlled. And that tells you something. You are not going to go against the grain on any avenue that is controlled. And the reason it is controlled is because it reaches hundreds of thousands of mine. I've been at this since online since 2012, but online since 2013. And look, I've got like 140,000 subs. I have people in the know say that if I multiply that by 10, you're closer, which is hard to dismiss because I don't think there's a country with an internet connection, which isn't at least peripherally aware of the lunar wave. But anyhow, that does bring the first hour of episode 156 to a close. And Rose, I did not forget, we hope you all will come over to crow777radio.com. And when we have someone like Baldini on, you can bet your bottom dollar that we're going to talk about a lot of things in hour two that just don't fly here. The very last episode I put up, simply talking with a man about filming in sun, was censored all across Europe, all across Canada, and even parts of the United States to include California on upload took 24 hours to show up in my management system that YouTube has so conveniently now forced us into, which basically deprives you of all the information you used to be able to get out. Anyhow, come join us at crow777radio.com for hour two of episode 156. There it is, man. Cheers.